Excuse me, you're excessive there. Thank you. Thank you. It's all business today. That's true. Right. Um, good, good morning, everyone. I call to order the annual meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Um, and a good morning to one and all. Um, the uh, annual meeting has one item of business, and, but before I turn to it, let me just note that obviously the regions are in, are in the room, you can see, but also regions Kenyanya, uh, Mehran, uh, and uh, Regent Johnson are, are joining us uh, via Zoom. So I think we're all here. So um, we have one item of business this morning, and that is uh, establishment of uh, meeting dates for 22, 23. Uh, before us uh, for our uh, review and action this morning uh, are those dates. Um, before we go any further, is there a motion to approve the dates uh, as they were outlined in the docket? So moved. Uh, second. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, colleagues, any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, why don't we just have a voice vote? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say no. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, abs I abstain. Okay, the, uh, there's one abstention. Uh, the motion is approved with 11 yes and one abstention. All right. Moving on now to, uh, uh, we'll move on now to uh, 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 our regular June meeting. The annual meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned. Uh, we'll move to our regular June meeting. Uh, we'll begin with recognitions. Uh, we have several of those this morning, and President uh, Gable and I will move to the podium. Good morning, everybody. Chancellor Black, if you would like to join us at the podium. Mr. Chair, members of the board, on behalf of a grateful university, I would like to recognize Lendley Lynn Black's exemplary service as Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Chancellor Black joined the university in 2010 and during his tenure has transformed UMD into a world-class institution. His steadfast dedication to excellence and diversity has brought the campus to a new level of preeminence. Chancellor Black is not only an open, engaging, and knowledgeable leader, he is also a kind and thoughtful person with an excellent sense of humor. He has become the embodiment of UMD and will be greatly missed by the university's students, faculty, and staff. Lynn, we are better as a university system because of your leadership and countless contributions. I have immensely valued your partnership and friendship over the past several years, and we all know you will continue to succeed in your future endeavors right in Duluth, Minnesota. So we wish you all the very best. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, make a few comments. First of all, thank you, President Gable. And, and I, I have the great honor uh, of uh, reading to you the certificate. Uh, the Regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with sincere gratitude and admiration the exceptional dedication, service, and contributions of Lenley Black, University of Minnesota Duluth Chancellor. The ninth Chancellor of the Duluth campus, Black achieved important successes across numerous initiatives, including the creation of UMD's comprehensive strategic plan, a dedicated focus on a more inclusive campus climate, and increased engagement in campus and community equity and diversity. <clears throat> Under his leadership, the campus saw annual private giving increase from 5 million to 9.9 .9 million. Black is known for valuing genuine dialogue, direct involvement in campus stakeholder groups, and his openness, and as you've already heard, his sense of humor. He served as an exemplary advocate for the campus and the community. His contributions to the Duluth campus, its students, faculty, and staff will be felt for years to come. On behalf of the university community, the regents extend their respect and deepest gratitude to Lenley Black for his outstanding service to the University of Minnesota. We wish him the very, very best in his future endeavors presented on this 10th day of June.
<laughs> He's going to speak a few words. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm honored to be able to share with this day with my friend and colleague, Michael Goh. We've been great partners over the last several years, and I appreciate everything you've done for me in the University of Minnesota. I want to thank President Brunix for hiring me and both Presidents Kaler and Gable for keeping me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also being such a great uh, uh, leader and, and colleague, President Gable, I thank you. Thank you so much for that. I've also enjoyed my interactions with Board of Regents members over the years. I did not count how many Board of Regents members I've worked with, but um, someday in retirement, maybe I'll do that as well. Um, I'm also thankful for the many system leaders that I've worked with during my time here, especially Lori, Mary, and Janet, my chancellor colleagues, and all of the previous chancellors that came before them that I worked with with the University of Minnesota, as well as the many UMD leaders who have been my partners especially my current team of Amy Hytopelto, Lisa Irwin, Sue Bozell, Tricia Button, Lynn Williams, and Josh Burlow. I would have done nothing without my incredible office staff, Carly Williams, Bob Borden, Wendy Larrabee, and Lee Ann Ilmanen, and other staff members who came before then and have retired or moved on to great opportunities. I have a great respect and appreciation for the faculty and staff at UMD especially the faculty and staff leaders I've had the honor of working with. But I especially honor the students of UMD. They are why I came to work every morning, particularly the student association leadership who felt I was approachable enough and respectfully named me Channy B. <laughs> um, and Regent uh, Kenyanya can give you more details about how that happened uh, because apparently the title has stuck. Uh, the Duluth alumni, Duluth community are incredible, and they welcomed Connie and me from the very beginning and have remained steadfast supporters in both good and challenging times. But most importantly, I want to thank Connie, my love, who is in the audience this morning and continues to stand with me. We are an incredible team of two people passionate about the power of education. As I have focused on university education for over 40 years, she has dedicated her professional life to the critical importance and possibilities of early childhood education. And our nation will never reach its potential until we give proper focus and funding to the education and needs of young children. And to our, and, and in addition to our busy careers, Connie and I have raised a family, nurtured and loved three incredible children, and have blessed us with four grandchildren. We will be married 47 years in a couple of weeks, and we haven't slowed down yet, although I do hope to slow down work-wise very soon. But I truly appreciate the support and sometimes accompanied by frustrations I have received from the University of Minnesota system. Overall, it's been a great 12 years, and I ask you to keep UMD and the other system campuses in your sites. Fully understand, appreciate, and recognize our unique, our uniqueness and help us toward greater achievements of success. There's certainly an independent spirit in Duluth and the other communities as well. And feelings are, we feel sometimes like we're running against the wind. However, we also value our important place in the University of Minnesota system and I hope the next chancellor will have your total support to build upon what we have and to do great things. Thank you all very much. I wish you well. Michael, if you'd like to join us. Mr. Chair and members of the board, on behalf of the Thankful University, I would like to recognize Michael Goh's distinguished service as Vice President for Equity and Diversity. 
Go joined the university in 2000 and graciously stepped away from his faculty position to accept the position of vice president for equity and diversity in 2018. He is a discerning leader who has significantly strengthened the university's relationship with tribal nations and brought system-wide equity and diversity initiatives to a new level of excellence. Michael, the Office of Equity and Diversity and the university system as a whole is stronger and fairer because of your leadership and numerous contributions. My sincerest appreciation to you and our very best wishes to you as you thankfully return to your faculty appointment in the College of Education and Human Development. So let me um, now um, uh, present the certificate, this certificate of uh, recognition, which reads as follows. The regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with sincere gratitude the exceptional dedication and contributions of Michael Goh, University of Minnesota Vice President for Equity and Diversity. During his tenure, Goh strengthened and guided system-wide equity and diversity initiatives, notably the university's relationship with tribal nations and the hiring of the university's first senior director of American Indian Tribal Nations Relations. Under his leadership, the Office of Equity and Diversity advanced its mission, vision, and values by increasing representational diversity, improving campus climate, building, supporting, and aligning partnerships. Go is known for being a leader who values cultural diversity to advance education and knowledge. He served as a strong advocate for the office and community, and his contributions to the university will be felt for years. And on behalf of the university community, we extend our respect and deepest gratitude for his outstanding service to the university. If you watch Men in Black, you might understand why that flash makes you forget things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to remember what I was going to say. <laughs> In, in moments like this, it's, it's these occasions, it's, it's uh, easy. I think a lot of people talk about mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. There is one unambiguous feeling of grief that I say to you that this may be the last time I get to say, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swigum, members of the board, President Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, I am, let me be crystal clear what an what a privilege it has been to serve under President Gable's leadership. What an honor it has been to serve under this board. Um, when you count the years that I was a graduate student, um, it's about 29 years that I've been at this university. So this is, I hope, uh, my humble efforts to give back, to pay it forward, if you will. I must admit that I did not expect the level of politicization um, in this area of work that I've been a scholar and a teacher and a practitioner for more than 30 years. Um, but I hope that, that you've experienced from my office and under my leadership, a lack of politicization, that we approach this work from conviction, from commitment, from education, from a consultative perspective, from guidance and with partnership. It is hard for me to understand um, what could be political about the value that everyone at this university should feel a sense of community and belonging, feel a welcome and can thrive. It should not be ideological that uh, we expect our faculty, staff, students to conduct themselves with cultural competence, cultural responsiveness, respect and autonomy in their research, in their teaching, in their service, inside and outside of the classroom. It should not be optional that we expect our graduates to demonstrate diversity, inclusion, and equity skills so that we can all help solve the complex, increasingly sophisticated, layered, 
cultural issues, racial issues that we face in this nation. For that reason, I'm grateful that the board allowed us this year to present diversity, equity, and inclusion updates. And you've seen the variety of programmings that we've tried to enact our representational diversity, campus climate, and partnerships that are part of the MPAC 2025 strategic plan goals. But let me underline the fact that programs do not change culture. It is the people underlining the programs, the people behind the programs, the people engaged in the programs, the people who hope we, who we hope are impacted by our programs. And for that reason, I look around the room and I'm so thankful for all of the people here that have become partners. Regents, thank you for your deliberations, for your endorsement, for allowing Commitment 4 to be in the strategic plan. As General Counsel mentioned, you inspire the community's behavior and I appreciate your leading by example. Um, President Gable, for your support, uh, for your leadership and for your commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and everyone in this room, um, senior leaders, faculty, staff, um, my special friends, Ted and Karen, who have helped us do amazing things with our tribal nations unimaginable. It is this collective action that gives me the hope and perhaps the promise. And I think now the conviction, and you've heard me say this many times, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I didn't really believe it but it has to be everybody's everyday work. And I leave this office confident because I know that this weight of diversity, equity, inclusion doesn't rest on one single future vice president for equity and diversity, but that there is a community that is able and ready to support our ambitious diversity, equity, and inclusion goals for MPAC 2025 and beyond. Thank you. Missy? Mr. Chair and members of the board, I would like to recognize Melissa Missy Juliet, outgoing chair of the Civil Service Consultative Committee. Missy is a finance professional in the College of Liberal Arts Twin Cities, and she's proven to be a strong and effective leader for all of our civil service employees. Her dedication and knowledge of staff governance strides in the advancement of CSCC's goals and involvement in important university initiatives. She has been helpful, friendly, organized, strategic, and effective. And I, along with the regents and the entire university community, thank you, Missy, for your outstanding service. Congratulations. And the certificate uh, reads as follows, uh, as, uh, as chair, Melissa Juliet has been a dedicated champion of civil service staff. Over the past year, she led staff governance involvement in numerous important university matters, including working to increase the visibility of civil service employees with the Board of Regents, the administration and governance committees, advocating for public health as it relates to COVID-19 public safety on and around campus consulting with the Office of Human Resources on the salary increase pool and equitable pay, working with the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost's Academic Calendar Task Force, uh, ta task force and OHR to recognize uh, the Juneteenth holiday and hosting six webinars on topics relevant to current workplace. The university has benefited greatly from, Juliet, from Juliet's ardent direction of staff governance. On behalf of the entire university community, the regents express our deepest gratitude to Melissa Juliet.
I wasn't planning on speaking, but I would like <laughs> to thank everybody for this recognition. It has been such a pleasure this year to be the chair of the Civil Service Senate and advocate for my constituents and build relationships with the president's office, the Board of Regents, OHR. It has really been a great and successful year. Thank you. Scott, if you could join us. Mr. Chair and members of the board, I would like to recognize Scott Creer, the outgoing chair of the Academic Professionals and Administrators Consultative Committee, known affectionately as PAC. Scott is the coordinator of housing properties in housing and residential life Twin Cities. Over the past year, Scott has been a distinguished steward, passionate advocate, and respected partner for all of our PA employees. His commitment, fortitude, and tact have brought PAC to a higher level of accomplishment. I and the Regents and the entire university community thank you, Scott, for your friendship, partnership, advocacy, and outstanding service. Congratulations. And I'll just again read the certificate. Uh, as chair, Creer has served as a strong advocate for PA staff. Over the past year, he led staff governance involvement in important uni university matters, including working to identify, quantify, and communicate PA employees' connection to MPAC 25 goals, working collaboratively with senior leaders and the Office of Human Resources on COVID 19, vacation deferral, and non renewal policies work with flexibility and how it applies to PNA staff and the PEAK initiative. Additionally, the Professional Development and Recognition Subcommittee developed, organized, and facilitated large-scale professional development sessions for PNA employees. So on behalf of the entire university community, the regents of the university express their deepest gratitude to Scott Creer. I would just like to express gratitude to my colleagues for giving me the honor of serving in this role. Um, it really has been one of the uh, best experiences that I've had here at the university, being able to represent you all and um, being a voice for you all, although sometimes probably a loud voice. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for that honor. And thank you, President Gable. Thank you for the honor. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. All right, uh, continuing with our agenda now, the next item of business before us is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. And, and a second, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. Nose? aye. All right, the motion is approved. And next we'll hear from the report of the president, President Gable. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum and members of the board. As May has become June and spring is now just about summer, we recognize with a lot of reflection all that we've been through as a university community this past year, this past few years. Historic events have defined our times. That was a lot of what we've discussed up to this point. 
and a worldwide pandemic has changed the way we live, learn, work, and serve. And while we've certainly experienced painful times, that pain has led to greater advocacy, allyship, action in the fight for equity and justice and a variety of other silver linings amidst the clouds. So at the University of Minnesota, we've taken a deep look at our work and mission and we're emerging confident about the future and in the shared belief that our best days lie ahead. So members of the board, the 2022 legislative session adjourned late last month without the legislature passing a supplemental higher education bill or capital investment bill. As we all know, only the governor can call special session and we are waiting to hear at this time whether that will happen. Despite this, state leaders did agree on several new funding provisions for the university. These include nearly $20 million in research for funding projects through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, 1.5 million for equipment purchases at the Vet Diagnostics Lab, 1.26 million for the Forever Green Initiative, and 20 million in ALS research grants. Uh, the state also enacted a bill in consultation with us to move the Rare Disease Advisory Council from the University of Minnesota and place it with the Minnesota Council on Disabilities, which is a good and sustainable location for that work. We will continue to advocate for both our capital and supplementary budget requests and look forward to keeping you posted on developments. In other developments um, regarding our senior leadership searches, in November, we announced the launch of three competitive national searches for key leadership positions at the university, Vice President for Research, Vice President for Equity and Diversity, and University of Minnesota Duluth Chancellor. Members of the board, I'm delighted to announce that Dr. Shashank Priya will be our next Vice President for Research effective September 30th, pending your approval today. Dr. Priya is a leading scholar, researcher, and administrator with deep experience in relationships across academia, industry, and the public sector, including at land-grant institutions. Since 2018, Dr. Priya has served as Penn State University's Associate Vice President for Research and Director of Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Senior Vice President for Research. He is also Professor of Material Science and Engineering, and we look forward to welcoming Dr. Priya as the next leader of our world-class top 10 research enterprise. I'd also like to extend sincere appreciation to Michael Oakes for his dedicated service, stewardship, partnership, and many important contributions as a member of the faculty and while serving as interim vice president for research over the past year. And we also wish him all the very best as he sets to join Case Western University as their inaugural senior vice president for research and technology in the fall. My thanks as well to co-chairs Rachel Croson and Jacob Tolar and members of the search committee and to the many members of the university community who engaged in this search process. Members of the board, despite the university's robust enthusiasm and commitment across the entire search process, as an update on our next search, our search for the UMD chancellor did not yield the next campus's leader. The selection of UMD's 10th chancellor is a critically important hire to me personally and to the leadership team and of course to the Duluth campus and community, the state of Minnesota arguably in the world. And searches sometimes have this outcome. And we say that even though there were many qualified candidates in the pool, the only actual failure is to have the wrong person in the role. So as such, and in an important shared next step, we've started the process of accepting nominations for the position of UMD interim chancellor to lead the campus for a two-year term. A subset of those individuals nominated have been asked to formally apply. And upon my review of those nominations, we look forward to sharing with you the name of UMD's interim chancellor, ideally on, on a, a, a wish list by the end of June. So my thanks to the search co-chairs, Myron Franz, and Jennifer Menzel and members of the committee and all those across the UMD campus and in the Duluth community and our system for your participation in this search and your important voices and countless contributions, which have really been invaluable. And lastly, of our three national searches, the Vice President for Equity and Diversity, it's nearing its end and we look forward to sharing details with you on that search soon. So members of the board, um, with regard to public safety, we continue to remain diligent in our public safety efforts, which are centered in the prioritization of our students, staff, and faculty safety, in every sense of that word, both on campus and in the neighborhoods surrounding our campus. You heard yesterday how we have made strategic and specific steps to address national challenges and local problems, including hiring new officers, hiring safety ambassadors, social workers, and community liaisons. We've installed blue light kiosks, enhanced lighting, acquired the Rave Escort app, and provided additional patrols in these off-campus neighborhoods with our own officers 
while working collaboratively with Minneapolis Police Department, the Hennepin Sheriff's Office, and others. We have done so, and very important to us, without losing sight of the expectations and values of our campus community. And I especially want to acknowledge Chief Clark and every member of UMPD who live those values every day. We are very fortunate for their service and very much appreciate them. Um, this is a summary of what you heard yesterday. And I want to add to the report that you heard yesterday that um, our Department of Public Safety has partnered with our Office of Measurement Services to distribute a public safety survey. We actually do this every two to three years, and it's good timing that this would be the moment in the cycle to reignite that and reissue that survey. We'll collect information that will assist the Department of Public Safety with planning for future public safety initiatives. It will help us fulfill some of the MSAFE recommendations and of course more broadly gather feedback on safety initiatives and how we've been doing over the last few years. The survey was sent randomly to 5,000 students and staff on the Twin Cities campus in mid-April and we'll have results on that survey soon. So with regard to some recent events that I want to update you on, since the May meeting, I've had the opportunity to engage our community in some important and meaningful ways. I was able to go up to Duluth for Chancellor Black's retirement ceremony. We participated in the Truth Project Symposium, UMF's President's Club Heritage Society dinner, and I had the distinct honor of participating in the opening ceremonies of the Special Olympics USA Games in Orlando, which the city of Minneapolis and the university will host in 2026. We also welcomed um, the Finnish consul to campus on the Twin Cities campus. We did uh, media with M Minnesota Public Radio and the Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. I participated with the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, the NCAA Pathways Program, System Council Cabinet, Dean's Council, East Gateway Advisory Committee, met with our PRISM co-chairs and the Faculty Misconduct Task Force. I also joined state and national leaders in board service for the Big Ten, ACE, EMBOLD, the Minnesota Business Partnerships, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, the Fulbright Advisory Board, and APLU's Economic Development and Community Engagement Committee, and then was able to participate with other AAU presidents in a meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. I'm very grateful for the many opportunities we've had to engage across our university community and beyond in recent weeks. And we look forward to celebrating some important events in the coming weeks from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities hosting its inaugural Juneteenth celebration in North Minneapolis on Saturday, June 18th. We will have a system-wide presence also at this year's Twin Cities Pride Festival, which will be held June 25th through the 26th in Loring Park, Minneapolis. And I hope to see you all there. So speaking of pride, members of the board, I'd like to close my report as has become a happy practice with some shout outs that make us all UMN proud. So a shout out to Karen Strom and Gary Holquist who are retiring from UND athletics after a combined 75 years of service to the institution. A shout out to Peter Moe, director of the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum who is announcing his retirement after over five decades of service to the ARB, the university and the state. A shout out to our university police and public safety department for celebrating 75 years since their establishment by the legislature. And a shout out to the Gopher men's golf team on the 20th anniversary of their national title in 2002, which joins men's ice hockey and men's wrestling national titles in the same year. And finally, as has become a practice, we have a video shout out for you today.
Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, President Gable. Uh, wow, you've been busy. <laughs> turning, uh, turning to my report, uh, June marks the end of the board's annual work plan. So I wanna use my time this morning to reflect on the work we've accomplished over the last year. Uh, last July, the board and President Gable established a set of key priorities and those priorities were woven into board and committee agenda items throughout the past year. Notably, the priorities were tied to impact 2025 system-wide strategic plan and designed to ensure governance oversight on several key initiatives. So let me note important progress on some key topics uh, throughout the year. Uh, the PEAK initiative, equity, diversity, and inclusion, including updates from all campuses, uh, campus planning efforts culminating in adoption of a new master plan for the Twin Cities campus, enrollment strategies across our system. And yesterday in Mission Fulfillment Committee, we had a very robust discussion about the status and potential future strategies for distributed, uh, uh, distributed learning. And over the course of the year, we also undertook a significant multi-meeting conversation with Dr. Jacob Toller and medical school leadership to better understand health sciences strategies around education and clinical care in an effort to guide our medical enterprise to better serve the people of Minnesota. I'd also like to note that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to stress the university in ways we wouldn't have, uh, we could never have anticipated. In spite of the challenges over the last two years, the universities continued to make significant progress on key initiatives and find opportunities for innovation. And I'll mention just a few. Uh, the important work with tribal nations and the hiring of Karen Diver to serve as the university's first senior advisor to the president for Native American affairs, achieving a 74% four-year graduation rate on the Twin Cities campus, the launch of a UMR's Next Gen Med program, the opening of the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, innovative financial stewardship through the use of interest-only bonds, the development of the farm, future of advanced agricultural research in Minnesota, uh, the development of the farm initiative in collaboration with Minnesota State, and of course, the successful conclusion of the Driven campaign that raised $4.4 billion through system-wide philanthropic efforts. Although this year's work plan comes to an end, of course, our work is ongoing. Next month, we'll spend some time with President Gable uh, and we'll work to establish our key priorities for the 2020, the 22, 23 year and look forward to sharing those uh, priorities with the university community in the fall. And finally, I'll note yesterday, we had a robust discussion on public safety on and around our Twin Cities campus. Public safety continues to be challenging, but know that this board and university leadership view the health and safety of our university community as paramount. That concludes my comments. We'll turn to the next agenda item, which is um, uh, item five, receive and file reports. Please note those items uh, in the docket materials. Now we'll consider the consent report. Is there a motion to approve the consent report? So moved. Second. second. Thank you, so, uh, Regent, Regent Hips. Moved and seconded, any discussion? There being no uh, questions or comments, all those in favor of approving the consent report, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion is approved. So now uh, we'll turn to uh, item seven, which is uh, a regular June item, the report of the faculty and Senate consultative committee. We wanna welcome FCC chair, Professor Ned Patterson, Thank you, uh, thank you, Ned, for being here. President Gable, would you like to provide um, an introductory comment uh, before we turn it over to Professor Patterson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Svigam, and members of the board. We are more fortunate than we can say to have one of the strongest and most active university senate shared governance systems amongst our peer institutions or really anywhere in my experience, and an engaged community that shares the same sense of permit purpose, which is the good work of the university. Today, we recognize that work and service of our faculty consultative committee chair, Ned Patterson. I've been very fortunate to work closely with Ned over the last two years, first as vice chair of the FCC and then as chair for the last year, as well as benefiting from his insights as a member of the senior leadership team and with some frequency on the emergency management policy committee, although I'm pleased to report less often than we used to have to. Ned has helped to guide the university our faculty and our entire shared governance process through a challenging and yet historical time and we're all better off for it. 
I'd also like to extend my sincere thanks to Scott Creer from PNA and Missy Juliet from Civil Service, Serene Milliken from the Student Senate Consultative Committee, as well as Aaron Heath and our Senate Office staff for your service, commitment, and voice, and for all that we do together to support governance and the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Professor, over to you and welcome. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sviggum, members of the Board of Regents and President Gable. On behalf of Vice Chair Colleen Flaherty Manchester, my other colleagues in the faculty and Senate Consultative Committees, I'm pleased to present to the Board of Regents our committee's spring semester report. As you have my full written report in the docket, I will highlight the number of items from it, but not read every item, every word. We had numerous meetings of the faculty consultative committee and Senate consultative committees, one special faculty Senate meeting, and our three regularly scheduled faculty and university Senate meetings. Vice Chair uh, Manchester and I also continue to serve on President Gable's EMPC committee, as she just mentioned, regarding COVID policies. And as FCC chair, I was on the president's senior leadership team, including the once a semester senior leadership retreat, half day retreats, which it was really uh, impressive to see and, and participate in. For the second year, the chair and vice chair of the student civil service p &A and faculty consultative committees are meeting ahead of every regularly scheduled Senate consultative committee meeting to discuss topics of common interest and determine together agendas for upcoming SEC meetings and really work together even more effectively. And of course, it's been another challenging semester for us all, but there's been many positive outcomes. Um, we, the, our leadership and committees were very pleased with your approval of the namings and renamings policy by the Board of Regents. And we had some input into that, obviously, of course. Um, there was a new administrative policy on COVID vaccination and safety protocol requirements for university employees and student workers. This was an expedited policy that went through last December into this semester and went through very well. We also heard from the Equity Lens Policy Review Committee, trying, as Michael was talking about earlier, trying to have equity in everything we do. Uh, so some of the other big issues. Uh, to the faculty senate, we heard recommendations of a task force on disability accommodations in the learning environment. Um, the university senate approved a resolution uh, a couple of years ago to have recommendations, and then the recommendations were presented to us in March, um, which the uh, university faculty senate actually endorsed them enthusiastically, and faculty are excited to have a little more learnings, and when students uh, get an accommodations from the Disability Accommodation Center on how to best serve the students, um, and we're excited about that. Uh, the Ukraine, the terrible Ukraine invasion in response to Russia's invasion, both the Student Senate and Equity Access and Diversity Committees of the Senate called for the university to condemn the invasion, divest from Russian interests, and provide resources to affected members of the university communities. And a statement was resoundingly endorsed at a faculty Senate and university Senate meetings. The Faculty Advisory Committee on the Health Sciences uh, that used to be the Health Sciences Faculty Consultative Committee has been re-envisioned as the Academic Health Sciences has been realigned as now the Faculty Advisory Committee on the Health Sciences. And it's really set up to be well going forward. And the committee is really positioned to address the intersection of issues that sometimes overlap with our main Faculty Consultative Committee. There's the Senate Committee on Faculty Affairs and work related to addressing the fixed term and clinical faculty issues. As I reported uh, with Rebecca Ropers last month, the fixed term faculty and academic professional subcommittee uh, was formed and is now being set up and will start its work in the fall. Again, the work will be concerned with all matters related to fixed term faculty and PA with primary teaching or research responsibilities. The subcommittee is positioned to address the intersection. Again, there's a lot of overlap in these issues, and we're really trying to coordinate it well. Uh, issues between the Senate Committee on Faculty Affairs, the Professional Administrative Consultative Committee, where a number of lecturers, senior lecturers are there uh, doing our teaching and research missions, uh, the Senate Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee, and again, the Health Sciences Faculty Consultative Committee as clinical faculty are in that category very often. Uh, for the Senate Consultative Committee, we had issues related to budget and salary were a major focus for our committee. And uh, this came from the leadership of PAC, uh, Civil Service Consultative Committee, and FCC. And you can see additional details about that in the PAC and CSCC reports in this docket. Uh, members of SCC discussed recent advocacy efforts around raising student wage floor to $15 per hour and the implications of those proposed changes with Julie Tonneson. 
Uh, recent resolution also advocated for relief for student employees, specifically graduate students receiving stipends. After consultation on stipend issues in the governance system with administration student leadership, the SCC presented a three-part resolution on April in our April meeting, addressing the hardships in the original resolution with all three parts receiving strong affirmative vote. Uh, the first part to spread out student service fees for graduate students over the semester without an additional fee. They usually have to pay them right up front, uh, which is a hard thing. Um, transparency, letting, transparency and letting incoming graduate students know about the fees, which is, is a policy, but just to make sure that is happening consistently and requesting the administration to study the implications of reducing or eliminating fees for graduate students in the future. And we anticipate uh, an administrative response to that. Additionally, in the back to compensation, in anticipation of the annual total compensation report to the Board of Regents in May, Mary Roman Cool, Senior Director of Total Rewards, joined the SCC for a broad discussion on compensation for faculty, staff, and staff at the university. Uh, the SCC separately uh, began reviewing proposed changes to the university constitution, bylaws, and rules. This should happen every five to 10 years. So we're, that's a routine thing. And along with this review, the SEC is reflecting on its own composition and considering changes to the membership to make representation more equitable. It's fairly faculty heavy now, and we're looking at that and we're in a way maybe a leader among our colleagues in the Big Ten in that. For instance, uh, currently at the University of Michigan, uh, only tenured faculty are in their senates. Um, so we already included p and and civil service earlier in many other senates, and we're looking at that going forward and what's the best uh, makeup. Back to the faculty consultative committee, we hosted a town hall at the beginning of the semester to hear from faculty senators about how the pandemic has impacted research, teaching, and service, both positively and negatively, and what faculty governors should be advocating for to support faculty members at the university. And we uh, uh, had discussions with many fruitful discussions with many of you in our small group meetings about that. And then after that, we ended the semester by hosting a creative walk workshop with the Office of the Presidents. It was the faculty design thinking forum, the future of the faculty experience. The plan was to generate forward looking ideas and priorities what it, about what it means to be a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. Themes from the February town hall and that design thinking forum, some of which you've heard, some of which are new, are flexible and family friendly work, competitive compensation, salary, and benefits. And maybe could there be some new benefits that could be a win win? IT and technology support for teaching. Another one that's kind of new, uh, which I think is important, setting of norms around workday and email expectations and really having discussions at the, the unit level of what that should be and you know, really having work-life balance a little more exemplified and codified in some norms uh, to build connection and culture in our college and units, you know, with COVID now going back in person for more things. And also faculty want to find time to set aside to focus on their creative work. Uh, many of us had a really pivot to just really focusing on teaching and some of the other creative scholarship uh, was set aside a little bit and we really want to go forward and we're work working with the FCC and the leadership will be continuing to work this summer on prioritizing those recommendations and ideas and collaborating with the administration and implementation of potential prioritized recommendations. Um, we also had initial consultation began on the faculty misconduct task force chaired by FCC member and Morris faculty member Jen Goodnow and that will continue into the fall coming back to the Senate committees and the Senate as a whole. Um, as was reported to you last December, uh, the, the award for outstanding service to the university Senate governance was remained with a retirement as the Vicki R. Courtney award for outstanding service to the university Senate. We're very pleased about that. And I'm very pleased to indicate that this year's staff and faculty recipients are Missy Juliet, current Civil Service Constitutive Committee Chair, who you just saw a few minutes ago, and Finance Professional, College of Liberal Arts, and then past FCC Chair Amy Pittenger, who you heard from yesterday, uh, was the other recipient. I want to end off a little bit by extending my sincere thanks to Professor Cheryl Const as she ends her service as University Senate Vice Chair. Her wisdom and insights have been invaluable the last few years, and I'm grateful for her sage guidance and uh, mentorship. And we want to rec uh, welcome Kristen Hickman from the law school, who will be filling the role this next academic year. Current FCC, FCC Vice Chair Colleen Flaherty Manchester was uh, voted as chair, so she will be taking over July 1st. And uh, Current FCC member Mark B, professor in the College of Biological Sciences has been elected FCC vice chair and I'm 
very confident in both of their abilities to continue forward with all of our work and more. And let me finish by thanking President Gable, Provost Croson, and the members of the administrative team were working so closely with governance and I'm continuing numerous challenges this last year that challenged us all. Um, we had very fruitful conversation, converse, consultations about all these issues and more throughout the year, including also frequent check-ins about impact 2025 progress and peak updates. We also wanna thank the administration, the Board of Regents for listening to us and working collaboratively with us. While there are very challenging governance uh, issues that governance has heard about and addressed, I have truly valued my time as FCC SEC chair as our strong shared governance system as President Gable indicated uh, the intro to this uh, item are truly effective due to the de development of deep relationships in our culture and practice of bi-directional and very proactive consultation and collaboration. That ends my report. I'm now happy to answer any questions you may have. First of all, um, Professor Patterson, thank you so very, very much for your leadership and the time that you've invested in this. And I mean, you've just, it's a huge mountain of work. You've, 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 I won't recap it all, but everything from impact 25 to compensation, to diversity, to the pandemic, to your own governance and composition, and the list goes on. I mean, it was, it, it's a lot of work that's been done. And um, I, I have no doubt that this is one of the highest functioning faculty consultative bodies in the country. It's, it's, it's really very impressive. So my question is, um, uh, uh, I'll ask a, a quick one and we've got others lining up. It has to do as you transition uh, to your successor and I'm sure you, you've talked about this and I, I'd just be curious, uh, you know, one or two uh, areas of, you know, prioritization or focus as you, you know, kind of round the turn to the, to the uh, next group of leaders. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, definitely after the faculty design thinking forum and really how can we as a, shared governance support faculty specifically, but staff and employees too, in going forward, you know, after these challenges. So we've gotten down from those two forums, we had like eight areas we might prioritize. We have a survey out for that right now. And we're gonna be uh, consult talking with President Gable next week about it. And we're trying to come down between with her and Provost Croson to maybe two or three areas that we all agree we can work on. Uh, we've been continuing work on diversity, equity, inclusion, and all that we do. Uh, and there's some other things planned also already. We have an August retreat with the FCC that I've had input and Colleen and Mark are working on for that event. Uh, I mean, and one of those action items, and this I think really is more on the ground and local is, you know, setting up, you know, you get an email at noon on Sunday from your department chair or something, should you have to respond to that? And we wanna have a culture that, you know, unless it's really truly an emergency, we should have emails, you know, only during the work, Break, et cetera. And I, I think that's more on the faculty to work at <clears throat> that. But that's an, that we really heard that loud and clear from the faculty. We want to help set norms for the workday. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Regent Hipsch. I, I don't have a question. I just want to offer my gratitude and thanks to, to you, Chair uh, Patterson, for your work on steering the uh, committee and the faculty towards a great resolution on the whole COVID issue. I mean, the last couple of years have been very difficult, I'm sure, and I really appreciate that. It's, coming onto this board and being fairly new, I thought it was gonna be a much more difficult situation than it was, but you made it look easy. So thank you for everything you did on that, so. Thank you, and again, that was true shared governance, not me. I we really feel free to bring to those EMPC meetings, the voice of faculty, staff, and students, and. There was a lot of worries in those meetings and a lot of thought and looking back, it went reasonably well. I do agree. I think we really did it well in the end. Absolutely. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Powell and Professor Patterson. I just want to echo what's already been said and add that while I listened to your presentation, um, it, I couldn't help but think about how invested you are, you generally, um, in the future and that you, the work is really forward looking. And so that's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell and Regent Damport. Yeah, and I think our faculty town hall 
In February was a little bit more about right now, what can you do in the short term in our design thinking forum that was really supported by the president was the president's idea, in fact, and she really supported us and that was really trying to look forward and that was a really fruitful conversation with, and we tried to have, it wasn't just faculty centers, it was faculty across the system from various levels. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Patterson. Um, so when you made the transition from faculty into the shared governance as active as, you know, to, to be chair of, as, as you are, what, what was your biggest surprise? What was my biggest surprise? So uh, uh, Chair Powell, Regent Rocha, my biggest surprise, I think you don't, I think this is where one of our things from last year, we'll continue on this year's communication to our constituents. You always like you all hear there's a loud, some voices that are loud, whether they're truly representative, it's hard to know sometimes, but really we, we do truly have uh, proactive shared governments. I, even as the FCC chair, I knew some, but it's the meetings with the president, the provost, the other senior administrators that we ask for and have, and that it really is proactive. And we, we hear about things before they're decided, we really have a voice. And I think that's where we are at the top with our colleagues is that it truly is consultative. It's not just reactive. And I mean, I knew that, but to witness it and experience it, and that's where it's really been, uh, if I was asked, would you want to do it again? And I'd say, yes, in a millisecond, I really felt I made a difference. And that's where you can bring the voices and make a difference. And Very good. I'm going to follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, and um, uh, uh, as, as you make your transition uh, and you have the board here as an audience, anything we can do to improve the, the relationship, the process? The relationships, did you say? Well, the, the, the process of the shared, in the shared governance. Uh, Chair Powell, Regent Rocha, I mean, I think just to continue these strong relationships, I mean, I think there's that fine line between having too many meetings and too many, but I really think the, the, the good and the bad of COVID and some of the Zooms that you can call a meeting really quickly and see these faces, but you need some in person and, you know, with the relationships developed, an issue came up with the faculty, I knew it was a big issue, I could send out a quick email, something could be set up very quickly. Um, so I just think continuing those relationships and you know our, our smaller group meetings that we've had without having too many of them has been really helpful. And then the same with uh, this position being on the senior leadership team. I really feel like I could go to anybody with a quick email and get something going when I thought it was important. I think there's some trust in the relationships and just to continue those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, colleagues, uh, others, all right, uh, thank you. Professor Patterson, will you join the president in the podium? Mr. Chair, members of the board, it is oh. <laughs> 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 It's more for the live stream, I think. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, I would like to recognize Ned Patterson, professor in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences in the College of Veterinary Medicine for his service as faculty consultative committee and Senate consultative committee chair this past year. Ned has represented the dedication, ingenuity, intellect, and passion of our faculty and shared governance in thoughtful and industrious ways across numerous opportunities and challenges. I speak for many when I say how grateful we are for your service, your wise counsel, your partnership. I, along with the regents and the entire university community, thank you, Ned, for your outstanding service. And again, reading from the um, the certificate. Um, as chair, Professor Patterson has been a strong advocate for the faculty while providing effective leadership in consultation with the Board of Regents, the president, and senior leaders. He led university senate governance, governance involvement in important university matters, including Board of Regents policy namings, the new administrative policy on COVID-19 vaccinations and safety protocols, the system-wide faculty misconduct task force, the university budget process, an FCC-sponsored town hall and related FCC faculty design thinking forum, and a number of other key system-wide initiatives. We benefited greatly from Professor Patterson's thoughtful stewardship of faculty governance 
his integrity, commitment, and contributions to the greater good. So on behalf of the entire community, the Regents express deepest, deepest gratitude. Thank you very much. I, I said most of what I want to say in my report, but I just want to reemphasize in Big Ten governance meetings and national meetings that really, I think we are an example of really strong shared governance. They were specifically like the COVID decisions and EMPC and being on the senior leadership team, people were like, you got a voice there, you got to talk there. I mean, other systems are good, but I think we're really great in that way. And I really want us to continue to be proactive, truly consultative and continue in developing a relationship. So thank you so much. And yeah, if I was asked to do it again in a millisecond, I would, no <laughs> doubt. So thank you so much. Okay, um, colleagues, we're going to um, switch the order now. Um, we're going to do uh, our update on uh, Native American affairs uh, first, and then um, uh, we'll go to um, uh, the president's initiative on mental health after that. So turning now to Native American affairs, um, to lead us in this conversation, we have two uh, important university leaders with us, Karen Diver, Senior Advisor to the President for Native American Affairs, and Tad Johnson, Senior Director of American Indian Tribal Nations Relations. And President Gable, um, please uh, over to you for some opening comments. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Svigum, and members of the board. So as we have discussed many times, a key commitment in Impact 2025 is strengthening collaborative relations with our tribal nations. In August 2020, we began a formal and historic first of its kind consultation with MIAC or the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, where we agreed together to take on some important next steps, including among others to meet at least three times a year, which is now measured in our MPAC 2025 different reports. To advance this important partnership and shared work in May 2021, we hired UMD alumna Karen Diver as the inaugural senior advisor to the president for Native American Affairs, which follows the also historic hire of Tad Johnson as our first senior director of American Indian Tribal Relations. Both Karen and Tad join us today and will highlight important updates in our shared work with MIAC, including the launch of the Native American Promise Program, the Truth Project, the American Indian Advisory Boards, the Membrest Repatriation, amongst others. But before I turn the presentation over to them, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and personally thank Tad Johnson on the eve of his retirement for everything he's done to support UMD, his incredible creativity and passion in the development of curricula and outreach and all of the work you've done on behalf of the University of Minnesota. Members of the board, while we have taken very important steps in recent months together, we recognize that and acknowledge that there is still a lot of work yet to do. We are optimistic and energized by where we are today and where the future could go and our broader commitment to strength and engagement and partnerships with our tribal nations. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, uh, Gable. And um, I think we'll turn it over to uh, you, senior, uh, senior advisor and senior director for your comments. Thank you for having us here this morning. Um, good morning, Regents Chair Powell, Vice Chair Steve Sfigum. All right. Technical difficulties. Oh, I'm not in charge. <laughs> I'm not driving the bus. All right, there we go. Um, we're pleased to highlight some accomplishments for you. So I joined you. I believe 11 months ago um, when I was three weeks or so on the job. Um, so I'm happy to join you one year later and highlight some of the work of the past year. 
Um, we have had an impact with the Native American Promise Tuition Program, which President Gable has previously um, updated you on. We have seen an increase of about um, 26% at Morris, which is curious because they already had a tuition waiver there. So it seems to be having some system-wide impact. And of course, not everybody is committed yet. So those numbers will probably increase. And then we've seen a six over 16% increase on the Twin Cities campus. So incumbent upon us, while we are recruiting these students is what are we doing to retain them? So we're having some very in-depth conversation particularly on the Twin Cities campus around capacity um, to create a learner environment that creates community and support and problem solving um, for those students. And, and that is going very well. Um, the tribes were very receptive um, to this. Um, they challenged us to do a little better, get closer to the cost of attendance, as well as look at the Dakota tribes that were displaced um, from this area by the creation of the state. Um, that that wasn't of their doing. Um, and so those are considerations we can take um, long-term. Also, um, if we want to expand the waiver at some point, much like Morris for any American Indian. So um, while praising us for doing a good job, um, also challenging us to do better um, over time. So um, we will keep that under um, consideration and advisement and analysis as well um, with the Office of Undergraduate Education team. The advisory boards um, per the region's policy have been reconstituted. Um, the Rochester campus is doing some specific um, conversations directly with Prairie Island Indian community, which is its closest community, um, as well as undertaking some um, outreach with the help of TAD. Um, they will constitute their committee over time. Um, they have very few native learners on that campus, so it's better just to have those direct conversations um, with the tribes. Um, and then once again, President Gable met with all of the chairs of the advisory boards to receive feedback from that citizen learner alumna um, stakeholder kind of perspective, which ends up being a tad bit different than um, tribal leader engagement. Um, but all of those things are necessary um, for us to do our work. President Gable is meeting um, three times a year um, with the tribal chairs through the Minnesota Indian Affairs um, Council, um, updating them on progress to the resolution, getting their feedback, hearing any of their concerns. Um, not a meeting goes by that they aren't appreciative of the dialogue and the regular communication that happens and the commitment to problem solving. Um, the tuition program, it's complete. I should have probably put complete for now, um, but at least that initial stage is complete. Um, ongoing conversations are continue to happen with the Cloquet Forestry Center. Um, a lot of the conversations have been around um, what are the equities that the University of Minnesota um, and CFAN sees for itself in the Cloquet Forestry Center. Phone, kind of over. Passengers. If you hear your name called, please approach the podium and check in. One of our one of our colleagues is um, in the airport. We think that may have announced a flight. I didn't I didn't know if we had to evacuate or <laughs> I was ready to jump on Tad. <laughs> I saw someone rushing. Sorry guys. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm Thank you, Jane. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Me, please, I need to tell you please. this like a moment of post traumatic stress. As someone who worked in the White House, stray random voices like that are re usually re never really good news <laughs> 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 when we've had to like shel Sorry. shelter in place and things like that. But anyway, um, back to the Cloquet Forestry Center. Um, so um, I actually met with the leadership of the Fond du Lac Band last week and said, you know, what are your priorities? You know, we've talked a lot about our research interests and while we've moved forward with some really great um, cooperative co kind of co-management activities, such as some traditional burning, prescribed burning, which brings that back into a regular management practice, you know, you really haven't told us that. And um, so they're going to have some, it, it spurred them to have a chance to do some brainstorming and kind of visioning, um, and they're going to continue that process 
internally, and we'll touch bases um, later in the summer about that to see where our equities align um, and where we may need to have some continued discussions. Red Lake Medical Research, um, the external reviewers that were hired by the University of Minnesota have completed their review of the literature and any documentation that could be found. Um, the kind of ongoing conversations with Red Lake, they um, were doing some research as a part of this for the Truth Project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but they're undertaking their own, own kind of community assessment, relationship building, touching base with community members that may be affected. Um, so our ongoing conversations are kind of on pause as the um, external review um, gets written up by those consultants and Red Lake determines what would be the best way to continue these conversations. Um, for wild rice research, um, these are all Minnesota Indian Affairs resolutions, if you're wondering why I'm highlighting this. These were tribal leader identified. Um, wild rice, Dr. Kimball is um, implementing safeguards against pollen drift, which was one of the key concerns was about um, contamination of natural wild rice stands. Um, and then she's participating in the Nibi Monoman um, conference planning. Um, we'll present there to the tribes that are in attendance. Um, and has expressed to both her colleagues within the University of Minnesota, as well as myself, that um, she is challenging herself to learn about what meaningful tri um, tribal consultation is. Um, I think a lot of it is was that she didn't know what she didn't know, um, but she is very receptive to learning and building those relationships. Um, the board approved the um, memories repatriation. The final inventory is ready. Um, a bit of a delay came about in that um, the tribes, re the affected tribes requested that all of the items be repatriated together, which necessitates um, and a preference for the inventory along with other institutions that are holding um, part of the collection to finish their inventories. And so um, OGC had some um, kind of feedback about you know, what those cooperative agreements to do this jointly would look at. So it was a slight delay. There's also a slight delay in locating a location to return the ancestors to. Um, there's been increases in looting in the Southwest of um, historical sites um, that are related to tribal nations down there. And so working with the National Forest Service to identify a location, I mean, it would be poor form to return these things to their original owners only to have them stolen or defaced again, right? Um, so working with the tribes as well as the National Forest Service, the tribes got delayed a bit in their participation because they had some unprecedented wildfires um, down there and that needed to take their um, everybody's attention. So the process is continuing. There's no delay on our part. It's just bureaucratic. Um, and then, this was actually really interesting. Um, at the Indian Affairs Council meeting with President Gable, one of the tribes said, you know, it'd be nice to have a, like a list of everything that goes on. You know, we hear about some of it, but we don't know about all of it. And President Gable's um, staff undertook this remarkable review of all of the campuses plus extension of everything we have that has indigenous Native American or tribal equities. And it ended up being 39 pages long. Um, we've got some significant work that is happening um, in support of tribes and indigenous peoples and, and we should be proud of it. And I think it's a, a way for us to just pause for a minute and say, well, often we see the problems that we're facing with or the issues that get brought up um, where we can do better. Um, we should celebrate those moments when we recognize that we have some good things on our plate and um, have made some good relationships. Um, the best practices in tribal um, research, it's a, a protocol that will be voluntary, um, a form to be submitted through the office um, the vice president research office so that we know what's going on can facilitate consultation um, but also just a guidebook on saying what is those best practices how do you gain consent how do you actually engage in meaningful relationship building so that maybe what we're bringing back to the tribes is based on their needs um, and not our research needs or grant driven um, that those are a part of ongoing stakeholder engagement where we serve the, another um, part of the people of minnesota um, I'm going to tell you quite honestly, I had hoped that this would be done by now. Um, I not understanding the um, what happens in April and May in higher ed. Um, 
So this was my bad learning opportunity, duly noted for next year. Um, I thought I was gonna be able to get my committee of 20 people, which is largely faculty and researchers together sometime to finish it up in April and May. And clearly that was unrealistic. Um, we will have this done by early fall. I'm learning too. Yeah, don't ask for meetings then. Okay. Um, and then Tad and his group up at um, UMD does the tribal state relations training. Um, this is mandated by the state of Minnesota. He's here to answer questions um, on these two um, points, if you'd like. Um, 4,400 state employees have been trained. There has been um, increasing um, interest in other sectors and individual companies and in getting this type of training um, available to them. Um, and so they've been branching out a little bit with other stakeholder groups um, to provide um, kind of a history of, of federal Indian relations and kind of contemporary tribal governance issues. The Truth Part Project um, funded by Minnesota Transform where tribes write their own history. Um, the submission deadline for the tribes to submit them is today. Um, one of Tad's parting gifts to us before he semi-retires, um, we'll be working with the faculty advisory committee to create an executive summary. Um, just because we set that as a deadline doesn't mean that realistically it will happen. Um, right, Tad? Um, but, you know, hope springs eternal. So um, sometime in the next six weeks or so, we hope to have an executive summary of what does um, university tribal relationships look like from the tribe's perspectives, um, which will aid us really. So um, this is actually really groundbreaking. And I, ho I hope you all kind of understand that while some of these things I think might be difficult for us to hear, a true part of reconciliation is really allowing people to have that space and time to speak their truth, so to speak. Um, and, and many times that's missing. And you kind of sometimes need to acknowledge um, the hurt um, and the ways that mainstream institutions haven't always been inclusive, um, haven't always had that lens towards equity. So um, I hope you see this as an opportunity for what it is, um, for healing and for a resetting of the relationship so that we can start to clear that plate and look forward um, to more meaningful relationships um, that kind of aren't clouded by the things that are left unsaid. Um, so I'm actually really looking forward to this. In fact, uh, we will be the second that I know of to do this. Harvard just released their report uh, two, two weeks ago, I believe, um, where they did an institutional assessment around their whole um, history around um, racial justice issues. Um, and what they found out is they also have some huge contemporary issues to deal with as, uh, as well. Um, so um, kudos to everybody involved in that. It's tough work and meaningfully, uh, meaningful and important for moving forward. Um, and then um, Chad will also be working with me to adapt his training for the state relations for a two module um, training available through the Office of Equity and Diversity for internal um, faculty and staff here at the University of Minnesota. Once again, a part of our truth is we need to make that information available if we're gonna have expectations around doing better. And that concludes my report, except to say I'm super, I'm gonna miss Tad. Um, I'm really gonna miss Tad. Um, and I also see a lot of driving in my future as we maintain our relationships with the tribes. And we are both available for, did I miss anything? No. Okay, we're good. All right. All right, we're both available for any of your questions. Well, thank you for the report and, and uh, more importantly, thank you for the huge amount of work that has been done. We know there's lots more to do, but you've really, a lot is happening. I, I, I'll, I've got a question while we wait for, for uh, other colleagues to jump in, but I'm wondering, uh, Senior Advisor Diver, if you just maybe comment a bit on the, um, the tuition support. And you, you mentioned that you said 26% increase at Morris, 16% on the Twin Cities campus. Would you give us a sense for, um, First of all, do you, do you feel that that program now is sort of fully up and running and we're seeing the, the impact or is there more to come as just more people learn about it and, and you know, the, the reach of the program? Um, and is, it, is, it, um, is the impact what you expected less, more? I mean, it, I mean, it's a feel for, you know, the uptakes so far and where we are in the process and if, if, if it's tracking with what you were hoping for. 
we did see the Native American um, learner numbers drop during the pandemic. Yep. Um, they were a bit disproportionately hurt um, by the lack of access to broadband, um, things like that. They need to go home, um, you know, be with their families, take care of elders, things like that. Um, I really didn't expect it to be huge, um, just because demographically, if you look at the, the number of learners that would be freshmen and or tribal college transfer students, um, you know, that's a smaller pool. Um, I do think that the tribes did well in getting the information out to their learners. Yep. Um, I do think that if we move closer to the full cost of attendance, that that will help boost um, those numbers because those income guidelines, half of the cost of attending this institution is still unmet, which it you know could still be perceived as a financial barrier. Um, so I think that they're pretty, you know, between the Office of um, Undergraduate Education, the senior leadership team, I think they're um, very open to looking um, at enhancements to that to make um, the funding a little bit more robust and remove some more of those barriers. But the support systems are going to be key. In addition to that, we're also working, um, have a team that's working. We're starting with Red Lake um, Tribal College to work out our articulation agreements with them. Um, and then the goal is to slowly move through all of the tribal college to ease those transfers and make sure that they're not losing credits um, as they, they move into a four-year program. Uh, thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Powell. And thank you, Dr. Divers and Johnson. Um, my question is, a big question, and I'm not asking the big question today, but I, I'm interested in it. But when could you speak a little more about displaced Dakota tribes? And as we look at establishing or broadening the scholarship program, does that um, reach out into, say, North Dakota, South Dakota? Is it within Minnesota? I'm just curious what that looks like and, and what might be a student profile. Would it be okay if I defer to my colleague? Thank you. Uh, Chair Powell and Regent Davenport, um, not to get too professorial, but uh, uh, after the 1862 Dakota War, and the largest mass execution in American history, the, the founders of Minnesota uh, basically said that the Dakota folks had to leave um, and uh, Governor Ramsey said uh, either uh, they need to be exterminated or removed. And so consequently, a large number of Dakota went down uh, the river and then up the Missouri uh, into South Dakota forming the Crow Creek Sioux Reservation. And um, uh, they're not terribly, they're not wealthy. And there was also a bit of a diaspora of those folks um, in South Dakota. And so I think that is, is one of the thing that, things that upsets the Dakota community that uh, these folks that got removed from Minnesota and their lands were subsequently uh, divided up pursuant to the Morrill Act. And so Governor Ramsey referred to that as the Minnesota windfall. And as a result of those uh, lands being divided up and sold, uh, 35 major universities were built, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cornell University, and multiple universities on the East Coast. And so um, uh, those tribes, uh, those Native American folks that came from Minnesota, whose land was taken, um, uh, and, and the Dakota in Minnesota feel like uh, those folks also deserve an education from the lands that were taken from them. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, got, a, got a narrow question and a, and a broader question on, uh, in, I don't know if we've had a chance to really look into um, the, the, the increase at Morris, you know, being, I think, you know, Disproportionately high, and I think in a very good way. Um, but you know, in, in, theoretically, is it is it possible that this program got the attention of of, of uh, Native students, 
And then when looking at the university, saw there was a sense of community at Morris that maybe was attractive, or do we have any real idea why we had a bump there compared to our other campus? I would guess that part of it is um, getting back some of the students that um, took hiatus or didn't enroll during the pandemic. Um, the other part of it is that the Morris waiver is available to any um, enrolled citizen or descendant from across the country. Um, and the Native American Promise Program is focused on Minnesota. But I will agree with you that um, Morris is special. It's got a designation as an American Indian student serving organization because of its robust supports um, and community that is built there. And for a lot of learners, that's what they look for. Mr. Chair, hello, thank you, uh, Dr. Diver. I, um, the other question is, and we, I, we've had a, a bit of a conversation about this before, but um, as this program moves forward and impacts a, a broader number of, of students, you know, we, we know that the, you know, there's been some criticism about some you know, the native schools from a century or more ago um, in, in the role that they had in, in impacting native communities and, and I, I think almost a sense of, of forced, if not voluntary integration. Um, how do we work through a program like this? We're not on, we're not on reservations, we're obviously in the community. How do you find that balance between seeking native students to access this education, but not in, in such a way as to sort of create an integration that really ends up dissolving what would be a historical uh, dynamic of, uh, for the native communities? Thank you so much for that um, question. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to be a contemporary indigenous person, right? Because, you know, you know that I was a former chairwoman. I ran a huge operation, right? I had a degree in economics and my budget was, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars. And I had contemporary workforce development issues and I had nurses and physicians and planners and teachers. And, and so there's that dynamic too. So contemporary education has a role in tribal communities in their own well being, their own self determination. Um, you know, the the work of assimilation assimilationist institutions is much different in a contemporary setting than it is now now we can speak our language and and teach it in this institution and have it invested in by this institution and have the dakota and ojibwe language houses and um and crank out teachers where tribes can hire them to preserve their languages so the sense of community you want to have from a student support purpose purposes that they find a, a home and a safe place because we know that coming in into a mainstream institution you get an extra burden of being representational right so they need a place just to go and just to be um, and not have to explain things but on the other hand they're investing in themselves so in many cases they can serve their urban native community they can achieve personal self-sufficiency impact their broader family or go home and we've already heard from tribes about regularly about their contemporary workforce development needs, particularly for medical careers. Um, you know, we have gaps in some of what we offer um, where indigenous issues are represented, you know, like the, the Humphrey School doesn't have a class except for the half credit one Tad teaches around contemporary tribal governance. So those are some of the things that um, will make these students more welcome and kind of challenge our pedagogy to be reflective of the needs of indigenous communities um, and not be solely from a Western thought. So, um, you know, a part of the challenge is us to understand that there is more we can be teaching and integrating um, that's useful to our all of our learners, not just our native learners. Thank you, that's excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, uh, Regent McMillan. Thanks, Chair Powell. Two thoughts, one, uh, thank you for your teamwork to both of you and, uh, and you've brought you know, exponential growth and acceleration and, uh, and under the president's leadership to, uh, to making meaningful change and laying a roadmap out for, uh, for addressing something that I think has been long overdue and uh, really, really meaningful and productive outcomes. So you are a great team and I hope that uh, Professor Johnson's uh, pending semi-retirement, I heard retirement, I heard semi-retirement, but uh, 
we don't want to lose you entirely. So, and I know, and uh, I know how much you care about UMD. So I don't have a question, but I want to share an experience for my colleagues uh, that speaks to the power of listening and uh, Professor Johnson, and I believe uh, senior advisor or senior director Diver also was part of this, but they offered me a chance to go down to the Cloquet Forest Center last, late last summer and meet with the uh, Chairman Dupuy and uh, his uh, three district directors. I don't know if I have my title right there, but, uh, and just listen. And I, the CFC is a place near and dear to my heart, as all of you know, and that I've made you suffer through retreats there for half a day and walk around in the, 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 you know, all the great things that happened there. And I thought I really understood all of that. And I'd read General Counsel Peterson's report about the history of that 35, 3,600 acres in the middle of CFC. But listening that day and learning and just wandering into that setting with, with only Fond du Lac members was extraordinary. And I left with an entirely, not different, but a far, far better rounded sense of, uh, of uh, what can be going forward, what has been in the past. And, uh, and I would encourage any of you, whether it's not necessarily that one, but the list is long and the opportunities to listen are great. And, uh, and these two made it happen for me. And I was uncomfortable at times, but it was really, really, really enlightening and uh and i appreciated it and i know that'll continue to be a priority and i think there is a solution there but just i, I have had a many amazing opportunities but that one was one of the most powerful comments at all okay uh chair powell and to uh, regent mcmillan's point could we arrange opportunities to to visit some of the reservations in at least in our districts and and learn more and listen because I think that's really an important part of making decisions going forward. So that would be I would encourage that. So mm -hmm. it would be my honor to facilitate okay. that. Thank you. Right, uh, Regent Talyarabi. Um, thanks, Chair Powell and uh, Senior Advisor Diver and Elder. Really, um, I just wanted to uh, thank thank you both for the work that you're doing. Um, I I think it's a really strong uh, and powerful demonstration of what an institution like the university can do and how we can be a leader in helping our communities to, as you said, to heal and to move forward. Um, I think uh, taking from that um, history and not just to teach it and not talk about it, but also um, to really um, lead our state. So I wanna just, um, say thank you for the work that you've done and for helping this institution. Thank you. Well, um, uh, Professor Johnson, I think on behalf of the board, um, best wishes in semi, full, or half. <laughs> I know where he it's lives. Pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty good, and we're, we're deeply grateful. And um, thank you for the presentation and the update today. Very much appreciated. Thank you for Thank your you, time Mr. and interest. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. All right. We'll now uh, move on to um, uh, number nine uh, on our agenda, uh, which is the um, president's initiative on student mental health. Uh, we have um, PRISM co-chairs, Associate Dean uh, Tabitha Greer-Reed and Senior Associate Vice President Aggie Tal here to present. And uh, President Gable, I believe, will be making some opening comments. President Gable. Yes, thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sigler, and members of the board. So a new study by the Healthy Minds Network found that the mental health of college students nationally has steadily declined over the eight years that they have been collecting data, with a 135% increase in depression and a 110% increase in anxiety over that period of time. The number of students who meet the criteria for one or more mental health challenges has doubled over this same eight year period. Tragically, we've also seen an uptick in what we call suicide contagion. And according to the CDC, one in four 18 year olds nationally are now more likely to report that they have seriously considered suicide. Members of the board at the University of Minnesota, we take this very seriously. 
We recognize the critical need to address and support student mental health in light of these trends, and in particular, in light of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So last summer, we launched PRISM, a key deliverable in MPAC 2025. And we have since made important progress in this effort, including new investments in mental health resources, new technologies, and other additional supportive resources. In fact, at the Association of Land Grant Universities or APLU's Mental Health Summit last month, one of their recommended best practices was to create an institutional task force like the one we've created through PRISM. We're proud to serve as thought leaders in this important work in creating a community of care and in helping students to flourish now and in the future. And members of the board, we are really just getting started. There's still a lot to do to deepen this work and ensure its sustainability. So I wanna give a broad set of appreciation and thanks to the PRISM committee and our work groups in that committee for their efforts to review existing and needed resources and advance what we need to do to recommend and launch pilot initiatives in order to achieve our goals. But my particular thanks to our co-chairs, Tabitha Greer-Reed and Maggie Towell, who are here today. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to them. All right, very good, over to you. All right, thank you, Chair Powell, President Gable and Vice Chair Swilliam and members of the board. In 2021, President Gable launched the President's Initiative for Student Mental Health or PRISM, which supports MPAC 2025 Commitment 1, Student Success, and Commitment 4, Community and Belonging. At the root of PRISM is the recognition that addressing and supporting our students' mental health is critically important and our ability to understand the root cause and mitigation opportunities is crucial. As President Gable mentioned, the CDC has reported that mental health is worsening due to the pandemic and it is disproportionately worsening among young, young adults aged 18 to 24. Many have sought professional care for their mental health, ranging from mental health challenges to mental illness. We know that marginalized and vulnerable communities are underrepresented in that number, so the opportunities and challenges are even greater. As a result, over the past year, we have convened a task, a task force to address the crisis of mental health among college students. The following slides have data from across our system regarding what students have reported about their own mental health. This slide and the following two slides show results from the 2021 College Student Health Survey. Each campus within the system gets their specific data so they would know the nuances related to why some numbers have increased or decreased for their populations. Our intent today is to give you a snapshot of some of the data across the system. Before I dive into the data, I would like to provide some additional national context. In December of 2021, the Surgeon General's Advisory on the Youth Mental Health Crisis reported that before COVID-19, before the COVID-19 pandemic, mental health challenges were the leading cause of disability and poor life outcomes in young people. And from 2009 to 2019, high school students who are now college age reported a 40% increase in persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, which equates to more than one in three students. These statistics show that even before the pandemic, this crisis was growing and our own numbers confirm that. As you can see, men average 6.3 to 8 point days of self-reported poor mental health per month across the university system. And women average 9.9 .9 to 12.2 days of self-reported poor mental health. Females across all campuses have a higher average number of days of poor mental health. We have seen consistent growth in this measure since 2007, but a statistically significant jump occurred between 2018 and 2021 for all students. Here are validated types of stressors that students say they are experiencing. It can be a conflict with a roommate, death of someone close, conflict with parents, or a mental or physical health diagnosis, among others. One silver lining is that being put on academic probation or failing a class are slightly lower stressors since the 2018 college student survey. Only about one third of students report that they have zero of these stressors we just showed you. And 35 to just over 45% of students are dealing with one to two stressors, while another 23 to 28% are dealing with three or more stressors, which can certainly impact their mental health and possibly their academic progress. The survey has found a connection between the more stressors students experience, the more likely they are to engage in high-risk behaviors or have a mental health diagnosis. College is stressful enough, but then the pandemic hit in 2020, adding additional stress to our students. Under the leadership of Dr. Catherine Lust, Research Director of Boynton Health, 
Dr. Carolyn Porta, Associate Vice President for Clinical Affairs, and Dr. Patricia Frazier, Professor, Department of Psychology in the College of Liberal Arts. A survey was conducted in May of 2020 to examine the impact the change to online classes had on students. Because it was still early in the stages of COVID-19, not all university campuses had the bandwidth to participate in this particular survey. So the, the data on the next two slides reflect students on the Duluth and the Twin Cities campuses. You will note that most students were mildly or moderately stressed due to COVID-19, but students with disabilities were impacted the most as they ranked their day-to-day -day life very and extremely stressful compared to students without a disability. The survey also listed 15 various stressors, and you will note the stressors in the column on the far right were the ones that students were feeling they were dealing with most of the time or always. The stressors with the highest percentage of respondents involved feeling less motivated at 59%, and 56.5% were having challenges with online classes. In addition, they were concerned about the future, especially related to disrupted internships and job opportunities, and they were feeling bored, cooped up, or antsy. Uh, Chair Powell, I would like to turn to Dr. Greer-Reed to discuss PRISM's work this year. Dr. Greer-Reed. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. PRISM will centralize work already happening across the university, as well as identify new areas of inquiry, research, and partnership. It'll shine a light on the importance of mental health care in the broadest sense, working to destigmatize mental illness and to meet students where they are. The PRISM Task Force is committed to establishing and even improving services, programs, policies, and academic practices that position the University of Minnesota as a national leader in a culture of care using a public health perspective grounded in data, research, and practice. As the co-chairs of PRISM, Senior Associate Vice President Maggie Towell and I agreed to work for three years, um, at which time the work of PRISM will transition to the Office of the Vice President for Student Affairs. So between 2021 and 2024, we anticipate that PRISM will synthesize work already happening across the university, as well as identify new areas of research inquiry and partnership. And we are working from a culture of care that doesn't exclusively look to mental health practitioners to serve our students, where our primary areas of focus, as you can see here, are prevention and upstream efforts, research allyship and early detection, services and treatment, and communications. What we know is that the answer is not simply to continue to increase the number of mental health providers on our campuses. We need to address mental illness, including root causes. We need to support mental health, and we need to focus on prevention. And this means that we will proactively work to expand access to preventative support and resources. And at the same time, we'll continue to have a robust network of mental health providers who can focus on students living with mental illness and related challenges. So after putting out a system-wide call for task force members and subject matter experts, we received more than 300 impassioned applications. So from there, we constituted and stood up a task force of 25 faculty, staff, and students from across the university system, including an invited representative from the Minnesota State System. We also added 47 subject matter experts with whom the task force engages to inform their work. So among our SMEs and our task force members, we've been really sensitive to system representation as well as student representation including, for instance, the Dean of Student Engagement and Wellness at Crookston, Savala DeVoge, um, Clinical Case Manager and Counselor Rep, um, Veronica Galdelis langer from Duluth, and RSA Student Representative Jake Atencio from Rochester, along with five other students across undergraduate, graduate, and professional levels. Um, among our SMEs, we have Lisa Irwin, Vice Chancellor of Student Life at UMN Duluth, Javier Gutierrez, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Success and Engagement and Equity at Rochester, Betsy Ferwerda, Crookston, Jennifer McCleary, a professor at um, Duluth in the College of Education and Human Services, Dr. Robert Dunbar, who's been really excellent on the research work group at Rochester in the Center for Learning Edu um, Innovation, and we've talked a lot about Morris. Happy to have Dr. Tammy Burberry, who's going to lead one of our um, work groups from Morris. 
So we just have a number of representatives from across our system. Central to the idea of PRISM is really understanding how and creating context for students to flourish rather than languish. Where flourishing includes psychological, uh, emotional, and social well being. So that is a focus on how we feel happy, interested, satisfied, and how we function as individuals with purpose and autonomy, as well as members of communities and society. So during the first year, we've learned much about the value placed on PRISM by our students, our faculty, and our staff. And while we're not surprised um, at the incredible interest in both the topic of mental health and in the task force, we've been thrilled with the engagement that we've seen so far. In addition to the many applications that we received um, to be part of the task force, students have reached out to learn more about PRISM and the university's commitment to their mental health. Groups have asked PRISM for their endorsement, um, in terms of different projects and products. And throughout the year, specifically during last month, Mental Health Awareness Month, PRISM's work has been highlighted not only on our own webpage, but also in stories on the university website, by a community um, journalism classes website that they created on mental health and in the Minnesota Daily. So this year after standing up the task force, we've established four work groups, uh, which I alluded to earlier, each has worked to develop recommendations and proposals that will inform our efforts over the next academic year from 2022 to 2023. This past year, the faculty work group endorsed a training module for faculty focused on responding to student suicidality that was developed by Boynton Health with several mental health experts. The group is also continuing to work on a multi-campus proposal to transform University of Minnesota learning environments in ways that support student mental health. And this proposal is being developed in collaboration with the Provost Office and the Center for Educational Innovation as part of the Higher Learning Commission Quality Initiative. Um, this year, the research work group drafted a C grant program to support mental health research focused on the transition from high school to college. As we know, the pandemic has significantly complicated this transition. And in 2022-23, PRISM will see research across the system and potentially Minnesota State to help us better understand and address complications um, with the ultimate goal of continuing to move forward in terms of upstream work addressing mental health and mental illness, including root causes. Drawing from data-driven decision-making, this year the communications work group proposed ways to make mental health resources more visible um, to students, faculty, and staff across the applications and websites that they tend to use most often, taking into account the differing resources and needs of each of the five campuses and tailoring information to each user based on role and location. Finally, the service delivery work group explored a number of possibilities for expanding care, including providing system-wide telehealth options and expanding the mental health advocates program currently run by Boynton on the Twin Cities campus to reach more individuals, not just on the Twin Cities campuses, but also across the entirety of the U of M system. Um, this group also focused on students helping students through peer-to-peer -peer programs focused on mental health, one of which we'll talk about next. So excitedly, implementation has already begun on several of the proposals. In late summer, making effective mental health resources uh, training for faculty and staff will launch. With respect to students, we continue to support and promote you at UMN, um, which is now focusing on new and transfer student awareness of this platform. The Office for Student Affairs spent two years working on um, working with students, I should say, to find an appropriate platform that would house all of the mental health and well-being resources in one place. And this is what this app does. Students from all system campuses can access the app from their laptops or their phones to find resources, um, set personal goals, and learn about a variety of ways that they can focus on their mental health and well-being. And it's important to note there was broad consultation on the app over the course of its development and launch including this past fall when faculty members from the faculty consultative committee went into the app and were really quite pleased with the content. So working with the Office for Student Affairs, we'll continue to explore how you at UMN 
and other frequently accessed websites can support current PRISM work and be the eventual home of PRISM outcomes. In addition to amplifying existing resources for students, we'll be piloting a peer training program in the College of Science and Engineering and looking to create broader peer-to-peer -peer training in the future. So finally, as stated earlier, we plan to finalize and launch the PRISM C grant program during the 2022-23 academic year. We're finding opportunities to continue to amplify initiatives that address the needs of diverse populations will also be top of mind for us. With that, we look forward to updating you on these efforts in the future and are happy to take any questions. Very good. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. It, um, it is such a complex problem. And we, you know, first of all, and that does not have, a, you know, a, I mean, it requires a very complex um, solution. And so we figure, I think we, we appreciate the scope of the work that you're doing and, and, and the breadth. Um, very, very much appreciated. Um, I think we have a few uh, to, to go uh, Regent Verhalen and then uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Paul, and thank you to our speakers for all of this information. Um, as a resident advisor at Duluth for three of the four years I was there, I certainly saw a lot of these stressors experienced by students. It was interesting to me to look at that list of identified stressors and how many things were still not on that list that are still perceived as stressors, food insecurity. It's a debt, not including credit cards. Credit card debt can still be a significant stressor. Friend conflicts, all kinds of other things. And so looking at these statistics makes me wonder what else are we missing? How else are these impacting students, et cetera? And I know you all are acutely aware of those additional items that are not necessarily captured in these statistics for students that are still facing mental health concerns. Also, as a resident advisor, I was a peer really to these students that were in my residence hall dorms. And I was trying to help them find resources, et cetera. And so seeing things like this app out here that really puts together all of the resources is really great to see and really gives that um, interface for those who end up being in a situation, whether it's because of a position at the university or because of an interaction they have with a friend or colleague, et cetera. I have uh, two questions. The first may actually answer my second question. What is being done throughout the system to communicate the availability of this app to everyone? And how um, loaded is it with information related specifically to some of the other system campuses for on-campus resources, not just virtual resources, back to the Twin Cities campus? At Chair Powell, Regent Verhalen. Um, we are actively promoting that you at UMN app right now with the new um, freshman class coming in. And the, your question about the app, it does have the specific resources for each of the system campuses. So um, I, I don't know if you, the link was working in the docket, you could, you could actually go on you know, yourself and, and take a look at it. But I think the only one that came up was the Twin Cities, but we do have them for the other system campuses as well. And then we're gonna do a very active promotion and marketing campaign this fall for staff and faculty as well. And we really wanna encourage faculty to hold, to hold up their phones with the app and say it's this easy to access these resources. And this is something we've been working on for years and we're really happy that this is the first time we have a centralized place for all of our resources. Did I get at it, Regent Verhalen? Follow Answered up. both questions. Perfect, Thanks. thank you. Regent Davenport. Thank you. Thank you for that good presentation and um, really appreciate how much progress has been made, yet there still are a lot of concerns. My question um, ab is about looking at the root causes and you had the list of COVID-19 stressors, which I might guess is related, but what might be some examples of root causes you might anticipate finding as you look at depression, suicide, and other mental health issues? And then um, how might those, what you find, and you're speculating, I imagine, with great knowledge <laughs> to, to say what you might find, um, how, how will, that intersect or look at looking at intersecting with the type of student services we offer now or need to offer in response. Oh, 
Thank you, um, Chair Powell, yes. Regent Davenport. Um, I appreciate that question. You know, I think over the last decade or so, there has been an established relationship between things like depression and say academic performance, where academic performance can be impaired. And with COVID-19, really, I mean, sometimes people just refer to it as the before times, right? Really sort of changing, <laughs> changing everything. There have been studies, one of the latest ones that came out just this year, a month or two ago, that started looking at causal links. So not just um, whether there's a relationship, but whether there are causal relationships and academic and family stress seem to be causally linked to depression, which then seem to be causally linked to impaired academic performance, which might make sense, right? Because even some of the diagnostic criteria might be around, you know, difficulty concentrating or remembering things. So all the things that can impair one's ability. So I think there are just some things that seem really directly related to student services, academic advising, right? And, and you know, things that we know, like we need to have a holistic perspective with our students, right? So there's academic stress, but there's also family stress. And these are some of the, um, these are some of the stressors that I think that we can, we can certainly address and build communities to support around. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd get to it, Regent Dampart. Mm -hmm. Very good. Our Regent Russia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, presenters. I, um, this would be a, Fantastic topic to spend days on uh, to get really down into the into the the, the depths of what what we're discussing and, and, and implications. I'll try to you know, keep it at sort of the governance level. I, I could couple. Um, I guess I got a couple questions. The first one is um, so as a as a National Guard member, I look back over 32 years of military service, and it's really characterized, I think, by kind of two periods. The first part of my service, we didn't really talk about mental health. And in the second half of my service, it, it's been an emphasis. Um, and you're seeking to destigmatize mental health um, and, and focus on improving mental health and, and, re and providing resources. Yet, yet the, the trend line continues to go up, I guess, to your perspective. This, you know, it continues to rise. And, and so, you know, not being an expert in the field, how do we... Do we spend much time, and maybe this is beyond your scope, but do we spend much time trying to understand why we see that trend line continuing? Because at some point it becomes, you know, um, you know um, virtually impossible to really, you know, move beyond this, this trend. And, and uh, it, it, you know, obviously ensuring that what we're, you know, what we're doing as a matter of responding to, to depression, stress, all these sorts of things. How, how do we, do we have the ability to understand why we see that trend moving in that same direction? Presenters. Oh, Chair Powell, Dar <laughs> Regent Rocher. Uh, sorry, this is no. my first time I'm managing. I read the protocol. I'm very, com <laughs> very, very comfortable. Very, very comfortable. Very comfortable. This yeah. is not a stressor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> you know, I appreciate your question because it gets at the complexity of the issue, and I think what has to be the complexity of the solutions. And I am a very recent administrator, so I'm just finishing my first year as an associate dean. And before that, had a long and really fruitful 15-year well, career as just an academic. And so the one thing that I appreciate very much is that we're in an R1 university where we are afforded the opportunity to do the research and have the time and resources to dig into those complex, complex questions. And the brain power and the intellectual ingenuity to develop complex answers all at the same time while as an administrator and the co-chair of PRISM, I'm focusing on just the really practical pieces too. Like how do we serve our students now? How do we address mental illness? and support mental health all at the same time. So I, I appreciate your question because there's a long end part of that, which I mean, I think you rightly get it, like trying to understand the why to these sort of multifaceted complex questions that will require multi-pronged solutions takes more time. And this is an urgent need where we also need to be doing in really informed ways. Mr. Chair, thank you. That's a very helpful. and. Stemming from that, you know, as an institution, you know, our mission uh, historically and, and presently is to pre help prepare people for their lives, to contribute to society and move on to their lives. 
I've uh, always been curious as to when we take, when, when we provide this critical um, um, resource, if that's the right term, um, in, in ensuring our students have access to this um, when in need, I always wonder, well, how, does the, how do they make the transition from this environment out into their lives? Do we have a way of assisting folks that you know, go from the support that they would receive here to moving out to any range of places that may or may not have the same access in, in ensuring that they're going to be, you know, continue to be successful even though they're not necessarily within the, the, the warm uh, confines of, of the institution? Chair Powell, Regent Rosa, Rosa, for students that we are working with, <clears throat> we definitely are helping with them with their transition out to the community or whatever state they're moving to after college. Um, our mental health providers, they really develop great relationships with these students. And uh, I'm happy to say most of them are, only I see a mental health provider for three or four times and we don't see them again. Mm -hmm. um, but we definitely are also you know, helping them with what, moving forward when they graduate. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Regent Tell your um, Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if, if the uh, speakers can answer this question, but I was curious about, I know that um, it seemed like during the pandemic, um, there were increased resources, both provided by you know, the Department of Education or others for the mental health support. And uh, it also sounds like there's new resources that were designated by the Department of Education for continued mental health uh, services. So I'm just curious on in that um, trajectory, like, how, how are we supporting this and making sure that it isn't just, um, I think the work is great and it's very necessary, but also making sure that there's long lasting support um, for the mental health um, um, you know, resources that we're providing for students. So um, just, um, I'm not sure who can answer that. I'm curious about that. Reason to tell you, Robbie, thank you for the question. I think President Gable would like to jump in on that. If I, thank you, Chair Powell and Regent Tayyarabi. So as um, Tabitha described earlier, PRISM itself is a, is a bridge project okay. where we're concentrating effort into the pillars that um, she and Associate Vice President Towell described uh, in order to get things going. And then the idea, the plan, is that at the end of a three-year period, in order to create sustainability, it would move into the Office of Student Affairs. Um, that is the, the the purpose of arcing it that way is in order to ensure that it isn't all exploration and in fact becomes operationalization. But the and so for a three year project, we're funding internally um, and the investments that we're making in the tools and tactics that um, both uh, Professor Greer Reed and um, AVP uh, Towel described have all been funded internally, um, some of which were have been budgeted over the course of a long period of time, and some of which are um, a result of internal funding or philanthropic funding. However, in order for this to truly become sustainable, it's not as if at the end of the three years we magically have everything solved. In fact, this is in itself a bit of a stressor that we often discuss because the time moves very quickly in these long arcing projects. And so the idea of um, pursuing state or federal funds, um, grants from foundations that are specifically focused on this type of work. We also have um, donors to the university who contribute specifically to this type of work in order to ensure that the initiatives that we identify today or the ones that we know will come from the um, transition into the Office of Student Affairs have sufficient resources as part of what the, the underlying work is. Similarly to what um, uh, Professor Greer Reed described and, and AVP Tal described around communication, that that is a parallel thing, but that is something we have going at the same time to ensure that people know what's going on and how to access the resources. Does that? Um, yes, that thank you, that's helpful. Uh, if, if I could comment, uh, President Gable, because you just answered my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. But, it, but, it, <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I think that maybe the point is, and I think you can tell from the, the, the questioning, um, we're deeply concerned about this. Um, we greatly appreciate, you know, the, the kind of systematic approach and, and you know, and, and wide ranging approach that's being taken to the point that the president just made, which I think really clarified that, you know, the work groups 
are going to sort of um, br bring us these deliverables in terms of tools and techniques and approaches, which then need to be operationalized by the Office of Student Services. I would, I, I, my guess is we're very keen to follow that closely. We want to make sure that you know this kind of happens. You know, e you know, don't want to stress, but either on or ahead of schedule. We're, we really, you know, appreciate that this is being done and and look for you know look forward to reports on implementation. Regent Hipsch. Uh, thanks, Chair Powell. And this might be a question a question for President Gable, but as we're um, addressing mental health needs across the state and across our institution. It seems to me as a former county commissioner for 12 years, there's a, a severe shortage of mental health professionals. So what are we doing to address that so we can address the bigger picture of- uh, Is that you or them or? I, well, I'm, I'm, thank no. you, Chair Powell and um, Regent Hipsch. I don't know <laughs> that any of us have the answer to that question, but I'll take a shot at it. So uh, to some degree, um, and then I'll allow uh, and ask Professor Grury to correct me where I'm wrong. But so we have a shortage of um, licensed mental health professionals without questions, a national, arguably international problem. And um, it's right up there with um, teachers, nurses, and police officers, right? There, where we have these high need areas where there is a an ebb in the um, student interest in pursuing those careers for a variety of reasons. So we do all the things we do in any area where we know there's a high workforce need where we have capacity and try to encourage students to enroll but I, uh, in order to increase the number of professionals. But one of the things we also have come to realize through the course of this very acute challenge is that we can't um, mental health clinician our way out of this that simply hiring more therapists or other types of care providers won't solve this problem, um, that we need to make sure we have enough to meet our current needs, but we also need to get at underlying cause and use a public health approach and go upstream so that we can figure out why the demand keeps growing or we'll never catch up. So it's both at the same time. All right, uh, anyone else? Thank you very much. We really appreciate your work. Thank you. All right. Um, so that brings us to our uh, uh, committee business. We'll begin with a report of the Audit and Compliance Co uh, Committee. Uh, Regent uh, Kenyanya, uh, can you hear us? And if you can, uh, please uh, share your report with us. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The Audit and Compliance Committee did not consider any action items this month. We had two discussion items focused on internal audit activities. First, Chief Auditor Galswick provided an update on our internal audits and, and follow-up performed since our February meeting. He reported in February that 29% of the outstanding recommendations listed as essential were resolved by university departments. This is significantly lower than the expected rate of 40%. However, Chief Auditor reassured the committee that the unresolved findings are being addressed, although the progress uh, remains somewhat slow. In our second item, Chief Auditor Galswick outlined the fiscal year 2023 internal audit plan. The plan includes 18 unit and process audits balanced across the system. Uh, he provided an overview of the strategic development of the plan and explained that it is risk-based and reflects the principles of the integrated framework of internal control in addition to addressing areas that the board and university leadership have noted institutional risk may exist. Um, I, we also discussed um, the internal audit functions uh, staffing challenges. That's a conversation that committee leadership continues to have with the chief auditor and we fully support his efforts to, uh, to assemble a full team that can engage in the important audit work. Thank you, Chair Powell. This concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, Regent Hipsch, will you report uh, on the Litigation Review Committee? Uh, Chair Powell, the Litigation Review Committee met yesterday. At this meeting, we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to the attorney-client privilege. Thank you, Regent Hipsch. Moving on to the report of the Finance and Operations Committee, Regent McMillan, please provide the report. Thank you, Chair Powell. The uh, report of the Finance and Operations Committee includes four items this month. I will take 
one item first and then the three that were approved unanimously second. The committee voted to recommend approval of the resolution related to the fiscal year 2023 annual operating budget. And on behalf of the committee, I move adoption or approval of the resolution. All right, on this uh, uh, item, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, and uh, Ms. Dirksen will call the roll. On the resolution, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Johnson. Yes. Regent Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron is absent. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent Taliurabi. Yes. Regent Taliurabi votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. All right, by a vote of 10 to one, that motion is approved. Regent McMillan, any additional committee business? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Powell. The other three items that we considered were unanimously recommended by the committee for approval by the full board. Those items include the following, approval of the resolution related to the fiscal year 23 annual capital improvement budget, approval of the 12 year lease at 150 Broadway Avenue South in Rochester for the UMR campus, and the consent report, which included three, or does include three purchases of goods and services over a million dollars, amendments to the university's retirement plans, appointments to the board of trustees of the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum Foundation, four employment agreements, the engagement of a debt advisor, and one other real estate transaction. Uh, thank you, Regent McMillan. Are there uh, regents who wish to separate an item recommended by the committee um, from the motion? Seeing none. Then, uh, uh, any Chair Powell, yes. on behalf of the committee, I move approval of those items. Okay, they've been moved. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that motion is approved. Regent McMillan, any additional business? There were no other action items this month, and uh, despite critique from colleagues, I think we got a lot done in, <laughs> in fast order. Thank you very much. In record time, yes. For the Mission Fulfillment Committee, Regent Davenport, please, uh, with your report. Thank you, Chair Powell. The Mission Fulfillment Committee report includes two items that were unanimously recommended by the committee for approval by the board. These items include the adoption of amendments to Board of Regents policy, student code of conduct, and consent report, which includes academic program changes and conferral of tenure. All right, thank you. Would any regent want to separate one of these items recommended by the committee within the motion? Seeing none, uh, any questions or comments? I move, regent Davenport. I move to approve the committee report. All right, second. Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Regent Davenport, any additional business? Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. Very good. And finally, Governance and Policy Committee, Regent Verhalen, your report, please. The Governance and Policy Committee did not consider any action items this month. That, thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. All right, that concludes our committee reports and brings us to old business. Uh, is there any old business to come before the board? All right. Um, new business. Is there any new business to come before the board? I think there is. Yes. Um, Chair Powell, I guess um, I would move a resolution first um, and then go from there. All right. It's been moved. Second. And seconded. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, would you... Uh, uh, like to uh, address uh, the motion before I open it up to board discussion. Yeah, and I'm wondering, I don't know, um, I know these have been read into the record in the past. I don't know if we need to do that or not. Great, no problem. Um, so thank you, um, Chair Powell. And yes, I would like to address it briefly um, and then open it up for, or defer to you for opening it up for conversation. Um, so thanks, Chair Powell and colleagues. Um, I'm bringing forward this resolution today for consideration because after 15 months on this board, I've had a chance to sit back and observe our governance and engagement practices and believe there are steps we can and should take to strengthen how we approach authentically listening to and receiving information from members of the university community. 
um, uh, based on hopefully all of your review and others of the uh, resolution that therefore clauses contained within the resolution are very straightforward and you can uh, view those on the bottom of the second page going on to the third page. Uh, this resolution does two things. It declares our support as a board for the value of public address and engagement through public comment and then asks the Office of the Board of Regents to develop a proposed framework for a regularly occurring public comment period to be implemented into the Board of Regents standard governance cycle. Regarding the proposed framework um, development process, the proposal framework development process, I include language that suggests that the process happen through the board's governance and policy committee or another appropriate venue in consultation with all members of the board. Once that framework development process is worked through, it would then be presented to the Board of Regents for review and consideration. Uh, one additional point um, for colleagues and, and others who may be interested, um, please note that there is no specific prescribed timeline for this work stated within the resolution. Um, this resolution simply and broadly lays out an outline and launches the work to develop a public comment proposal for the board. Um, as I stated yesterday during our public comment discussion, uh, we should never underestimate the importance of ensuring the people we serve feel heard and recognized by the board. Establishing a regularly occurring public comment period will develop, will develop or create a dependable and familiar venue for the university community to be heard publicly by the board on issues of importance. Additionally, I believe the establishment of a regularly occurring public comment period would be an improvement to the board internal processes by way of avoiding the subjective one-off task of dealing with the public comment type requests we've received in the past and will undoubtedly receive in the future. And what I mean by that is the process to deal with such requests right now are currently addressed by section six or article six, section E of this board's bylaws, which states, quote, the chair of the board of regents or one of the standing or special committees of the board of regents shall not ordinarily allow individuals who are not on the agenda to speak at meetings. The chairs of the various committees may allow such individuals to speak when they determine it is in the best interests of the university and will not unduly delay the matters before the particular committee. A request to appear before a meeting of the Board of Regents or its standing or special committees shall be submitted in writing to the secretary in advance of the meeting. The chair shall rule on all requests. If the request is to appear before a committee, the chair may also consult with the committee chair, unquote. So um, that is our current um, somewhat related process to what I'm proposing. And I think that um, the framework and kind of the launching of the exploration that I'm proposing um, would be a much cleaner and dependable process for us as a board and the university community. Um, so um, without um, being redundant and articulating what else is in um, the resolution and writing, I stand ready to answer any questions and sincerely hope this is something we can all support today. And then before I officially conclude, I'd like to ask for a roll call on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Uh, let's turn to a discussion now. Uh, Regent Verhalen. Mr. Chair, um, I move to refer the resolution to the Governance and Policy Committee. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Regent Verhalen, would you uh, like to address your motion? Sure. Um, the resolution as presented really presupposes that a regular, a regularly occurring public comment period beyond what we already have in policy is in fact necessary and the most effective and meaningful way for this board to receive public comment. Uh, the resolution is proposed without our board first having the opportunity to explore potential areas for further discussion and evaluation that I really think this board would benefit from in understanding and considering, uh, including uh, dialogue amongst us in summary on the various ways we currently receive public comment uh, and act upon that public comment that we receive, alternate ways we could perform receiving this information. Um, if further policy changes are even necessary with respect to the receiving of public comment by this board, and how other institutions not only currently handle the effect of receiving of this information, but discussions they may be having about their own policies and procedures. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to include that as Regent Hipsch and I had started work plan development for the coming year for further discussion at our upcoming Regents retreat and for consideration by our chair, we had included our intended, we had included in our intended work plan for governance and policy committee um, a discussion and evaluation of the gathering and receiving of public comment. Uh, further, it's crucially important that before this board is presented with a determination 
on whether or not to change board policy, we have the opportunity to discuss the items I mentioned above. Um, so in the collective, this is why uh, I made this motion to refer Regent Farnsworth, Farnsworth's resolution to Gov uh, to allow that discussion and information gathering. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Regent Verhalen. Um, colleagues, as we begin discussion on the Verhalen motion, and, and that is the motion that we're discussing now, um, I want you to confine any comments that you might uh, make to the action of referring the resolution uh, to uh, the committee uh, and not really on the merits uh, of, uh, of the, or content of the resolution itself. It's really a discussion of um, should it be referred to the committee for the reasons articulated by uh, Regent Verhalen. Um, so discussion, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would do not oppose the motion to refer. I would support the motion to refer. I also don't think that the motion to refer is actually in conflict with the re underlying resolution because the resolution doesn't call for a change of policy. It calls for a process to consider whether to change the policy. At least that's how I read it. And if that's the case, I think that if, if uh, the chair and vice chair of the governance and policy committee have this uh, ramped up and if it, there's a a process for having this conversation I, that would seem like an appropriate place for this to vest and would, you know, in the absence of a timeline in this document, I think it may actually be a more efficient way of, of getting to the underlying topic. So I look forward to the conversation at your committee if that's uh, what the body decides to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, uh, Regent Hipsch. Uh, just quickly, um, I support uh, the resolution. Uh, that's all I want to say. I support the Cool. Very good. Thank you, Regent Hips. Regent McMillan. Yeah, I also support the Verhalen motion to refer. And uh, I think we're right at the cusp of the work planning process. And I think uh, that'll to getting this solidly lodged into as both the vice chair and the chair of the committee of jurisdiction have, have already said they will do um, is the right way to go at this. All right. Regent Farnsworth. <clears throat> yeah, I think. Uh, well, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, I would um, support this as well. I think um, part of, or I guess a large genesis of, for me of putting this together is particularly given the topic of, of public comment and the nature of, um, you know, the whole essence of what it means to do public comment. I think it's, you know, I thought it was and think it is important for us um, to tell the public, you know, publicly that we're exploring this um, and that's going to be um, part of our work plan. Um, so um, hopefully that'll come sooner rather than later in our work plan, but I respect um, the motion um, that you made, um, Regent for Halen, um, and would um, support this and really look forward um, to the conversation. Thank you, Chair Powell. All right, thank you. And, uh, and I also uh, uh, support um, the action of referring uh, the, uh, the Farnsworth resolution to or uh, to the committee. So, uh, anything? Anyone else uh, want to comment? All right. Um, all those in favor of uh, of the motion to refer the resolution to the Governance and Policy Committee, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any? Are there any? Are there any opposed? All right. The motion carries unanimously and is hereby referred to the Governance and Policy Committee. Is there any other new business to come to come before this board? All right, that concludes our business today. The meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned.